My name is Kayla Gore, and I am the Southern Regional Organizer with the Transgender Law Center. Um, and we're hosting a live today. Uh, we have a great, uh, great panel for you all today. As Black, queer, and trans people, we experience so many overlapping fears of grief. Uh, in the last few days, we've mourned um, Ahmaud Aubrey, Sean Reed, Nina Pop, Brianna Taylor, and Amy Stevens. And yet our grief is only fully seen in its entirety when we're around other Black, queer, and trans people. What needs to happen in our movement to love, center, and truly mourn all Black lives? I'd like to invite everyone viewing this live to take a moment of silence in honor of those people we've lost this year. Thank you. We strive to make our spaces accessible because we know disability justice as central value in uh, politics of trans liberation. Disability justice holds access as a necessary practice for disrupting isolation and ensuring the participation and leadership of disabled folks. Access is meaningful when it includes a commitment to the racial, to the radical, deeply transformative demands of disability justice. Disability justice charges us to identify, interrupt, and disrupt all forms of, of supremacy, including ableism, anti-Black racism, misogyny, fat phobia, classism, and many more. By committing to build accessible spaces like we're doing here today, we are implementing a commitment to have critical conversations together. As an organization invested in ending anti-Blackness, as an organization with fierce Black trans leaders, we urge folks to take a minute right now, as you, as you view this live, to have a moment of silence with us, and we are here with you. Black trans leaders have to do liberation work even while mourning, because the mourning does not end. Black trans leaders do liberation work, with, work out of love for all Black people all Black people, while knowing that Black trans lives won't generate as many tears, as many cries of outrage, as many shows of solidarity. And still, Black trans imagination and wisdom continue to lead us to freedom. We won't stop until the day people everywhere pay the proper dignity due to Black trans lives. I'm going to take this moment to allow our panelists to introduce themselves by giving their name, your pronouns, where you're located, and your organization and role. And I'll start with Theora Thomas. Theora, we can't hear you. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, um, my name is Theora Thomas. Um, pronouns, she, her, they, them. Um, I am in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, my organization, the founder and director of Sisters PGH. Um, we have a community center specifically for our transgender and non-binary uh, community members in Pittsburgh. Uh, we also provide um, housing for our transgender and non-binary communities through our housing initiative, Project T. Um, I'm also a commissioner um, of our state of Pennsylvania for a commission on LGBTQ affairs, um, as well as our president for our advisory council um, of Pittsburgh. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Zahara, would you like to go? Yes, I can go. Zahara Green, I'm in, by pronouns are they, them. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm with Transcending Barriers, the executive director. Thank you, Zahara. And due to technical difficulties, um, Zahara's voice will be played on this live. Um, 
but because we want to make sure that people have ASL interpretation, her um, her video will not be shown. Uh, you won't be able to see her beautiful face, the most, their beautiful face. Um, we go on to Carson. Okay, let me start over. Hi, everyone. My name is Carson Graham. I am he, him, his is my pronouns. I am the co-founder and president of TIG. We also go by Trans Inclusive Group. We're here in South Florida. We serve Broward, Dade, and West Palm counties. I'm also the co-chair of South Florida Flux and also the board director of the Dolphin Democrats. Awesome. Thank you, Carson. So we're going to go ahead and get into our discussion uh, today. Uh, Black TGNC community standing on the intersection of violence and oppression. Um, and this question is for anybody. Um, how has advocating change during COVID-19 for you in your local community? Sorry, because you have to mute. Okay. I would say uh, advocating differently has definitely changed, at least here in South Florida. Um, we've been having a lot of virtual town halls, like we just had one on uh, COVID-19 recently. Um, also, a lot of political town halls have been going on and just strategizing to figure out, you know, what's the best we can do. And at this point, everything is just virtual. So, you know, we've been sending emails and we also have been reaching out to people in other states, you know, just like what we're doing right now is definitely a, a form of advocating, right? We're, we're doing this live through, you know, Facebook, um, through Zoom calls, through Zoom meetings. So just working together virtually. <laughs> We can't hear you, Ciara. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Great, great. Um, so I noticed the need um, became a lot more urgent than it already was. Um, if you take into the fact that, especially Black trans people, we were already extremely marginalized before the pandemic. Um, and to experience a first pandemic um, for a lot of us generationally, um, it definitely shifted uh, the urgency of the work that was needed, um, especially under the guise of cis leadership, right, um, within our, like, regions. Um, so it was definitely a shift of needing to um, survive again, like trans people are used to surviving um, in these economic realms that uh, seldom we provide resources for us. So it, it clicked that uh, survival apparatus back on, at least for myself um, and those around me to be able to not only support virtually, but find ways that we can continue to be close to community members um, in me uh, during this pandemic. So there's been a lot going on, um, but that's what I've noticed is like a, a change for, for us up here. Thank you. Um, so when you when you spoke, CR, um, what resonated with me was um, the resiliency in your advocacy and how it didn't stop. It just like just reinvigorated you to do more. Um, could you speak to like what does resiliency look like for you? Uh, like what were your strategies? Like can you give some examples of things that you've uh, done within your organization locally? Yeah, sure. Um, so one thing that we did um, in the midst of this pandemic was 
um, we created a mutual aid fund. Um, we called it uh, COVID LGBTQIA COVID-19 Emergency Relief Fund. And uh, during this effort, as of current, we were able to raise $31,000. Um, we've already uh, redistributed $17,000 directly back into the community. Um, a predominance of those were Black uh, LGBTQ folk and another predominance of Black transgender people um, in Allegheny County in Pittsburgh. Um, so by providing those direct resources back into the community, along with groceries um, and things of necessity that is hard to access um, for our communities with disabilities, um, especially, um, that was a huge thing for us to be able to cut the middleman out and just provide those direct resources um, back to our community. Um, I know an another thing we did while doing that was collecting data. Um, we were... From where I, from where I sit, um, the first organization actually collecting data directly on our LGBTQ plus communities, um, and with this data, we were able to uh, find out um, who was affected, how they were being affected, and what resources they needed. And um, with that data, we were able to share with our uh, commissions, our equity commissions, our human relations commissions, our advisory councils, those in leadership um, that are our allies and, uh, you know, are here to support us. So that was, um, that was a huge, huge uh, piece of resilience and what resilience looks like, especially for Black trans people. It's taking the precedence um, when things seem to be chaotic. Um, another thing that we are spearheading along with um, others, um, Selena Morrison, our executive, our executive director of Pennsylvania's LGBTQ Commission, Naima Sanchez of ACLU, and also the Pennsylvania um, Commission on LGBTQ Affairs. We and my board members, Aiden Nevels and Drew in Maryland, um, we decided to spearhead a transgender coalition of Pennsylvania. And I talked to you about this uh, briefly uh, yesterday about that resiliency and what that looks like. Um, ultimately, what that resiliency looks like is for trans-led organizations, especially Black trans-led organizations, coming together um, statewide, nationally, um, learning how to uh, start 501c3 organizations, 501c4 organizations, uh, for-profit organizations, um, and coming together to create economic wealth within our community because we have to start thinking bigger than local um, in this time, especially during this pandemic. And how we do that is creating these coalitions of healing, understanding, and um, unapologeticness of just moving forward and being able to provide resources for our communities um, when pandemics happen and just in regular life. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we were already marginalized before the pandemic, so this just heightened the need for us to be able to provide for ourselves. Thank you, Tara. Uh, same question: um, What are what what does resiliency look like for you in uh, Georgia? What are the strategies that you all have been doing locally there? Well, we. We have been doing many things. Um, we look at this situation as something that we can conquer, even though we were hit at a time that we that were completely unexpected. Our budget wasn't wasn't focused on direct services at the time, and we realized that there was a huge need for direct services after COVID-19 came around. But we also had to dissect and look at what we were dealing with. We're dealing with a virus that has hit the nation and has hit the nation hard due to the failed leadership in the White House, White House. And we have to figure out how can we navigate? We have to rely on our resilience. We think of the HIV epidemic was a virus that came into our community. We were resilient. We stood strong. We navigated. We pushed through those barriers that were in the face, even though we had failed executive leadership in office at the time. But we still kept our resilience and we fought through and we have used many things to defeat and to conquer this thing that tries to slow us down. And we look at this same thing as a virus with COVID-19. We look at what we're dealing with. How can we ensure that our community has the things that they need to protect them against this? We think of prevention. We already do prevention around HIV. 
how can we help prevent our community from being hit? Those are communities who are already dealing with other illnesses that are causing them to be immunocompromised. So we think of the ways of how we can help our community and that's understanding that we all have the skills to be able to make masks with Black trans women here in the South that are making masks and have businesses. How can we utilize these ways to protect our community? We've been using those ways of how we can protect and be able to support and prevent our community, those who are most vulnerable to this situation that has hit our community hard. And also our advocacy is important also while we're navigating through these spaces because we have a governor who has done everything in his power to not protect the citizens of our state. We are a state-based organization, so a lot of the work we do is throughout the entire state. So we're having to help individuals navigate because there's more systems in place. And with systems comes barriers. We have to keep in mind what are we doing to navigate these systems in place? How can we advocate for those who, who are dealing with the barriers in place and our advocacy have increased in that work? We have to rethink of how we're doing to keep in mind with all of the problems that we're dealing with, with organizing, how can we organize with, with in the face of something like COVID-19? And we've utilized technology, utilized Zoom to organize and continue our, keep our organizing alive so that we can continue on towards our pathway towards liberation for our people. Thank you. That that sounds like we're in good hands. We're in good hands. Thanks both of you all for all the hard work that you all are doing. Um, when you can easily just not do it, I really appreciate that, and I'm sure our community definitely appreciates that. Um, we're going to move toward uh, medical care because uh, you mentioned uh, prevention, and right now <laughs> that's a big thing. Uh, and for trans folks, for TGMC people. That's at risk for us right now. That's like in limbo right now. So um, what does medical care look like during COVID um, in your region, like medical access in general? Not just specific to COVID, but keeping that in the mindset of your response. Uh, Carson, you want to take that question? Carson, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, I, I wanted to add to resilience piece before I talk about healthcare too. Um, I think when I think of resilience, you know, we're constantly thinking about how we're recovering from something or how we're we making the best of something, right? So, I think overall, it's it's almost like a never-ending. It's always been like that since you know forever for trans folks, like. Sierra said, um, you know, like TIG, we are a nonprofit. We're, we're trans-led LGBT organization. And, you know, before these crisis funds came about for COVID, we already had one. So now it's like the need just got even worse. You know, so again, this is something that, you know, I mentioned to Sierra yesterday. Um, you know, now the funds that we needed are, you know, now we need even more right, in all these different states, uh, you know, even the HIV and STI rates have actually increased <laughs> due to the fact that I, I guess because so many more people are home, right? So now when we talk about health care, um, you know, even myself recently, um, you know, I'm still on HRT and stuff like that, or I still have health questions I may want. So um, actually here in South Florida, they are doing, um, you know, virtual cons consultations and virtual um medical need, they are still doing uh, testing, but testing is based off of appointments. Um, but obviously, you know, it's still a concern, you know, also for like, you know, sex workers, there's those that still want to make sure, you know, their health is, you know, still intact as well. So, you know, that, that's the biggest thing, just knowing what resources are, are available, but, you know, healthcare is still a concern. People still need to get, you know, their tea, their estrogen, they still need to get their hormone pills, they still need to get their PrEP, you know, everything like, like that, so. Thank you, Carson. Um, so, Fior, I know we had a conversation um, previous about the data that you collected and specific to uh, people's healthcare needs. 
Um, could you speak more to that? Um, yeah. yeah, certainly. Um, and I, but like, if I can just rebuttal before I get into that rebuttal off of what Sahara uh, had mentioned, um, and thank you both for mentioning these um, great points. Um, the resilience, right? It, it also looks like data collection. It looks like us collecting that data um, and using that data correctly. This current administration, at least, um, or our current administration uh, in the USA, does not affirm our existence. Uh, being transgender is one thing, but being black on top of that, being a woman on top of that is another scenario. So uh, it is time uh, that we take advantage of now, while this census is not counting our communities, that we take and create initiatives to count our communities through this next 10 years. So within the next 10 years, uh, we have the data to show the federal government, to show our states that we exist um, in these communities and we need resources. Uh, it is not only community members, but community trans-led organizations um, around the country. We need to also have access uh, to these dollars. And I would also send a su suggestion to our Black trans or trans-led organizations uh, around the country is when having uh, conversations with your funders, um, especially during this COVID-19. And I'm glad that our funders here in Pittsburgh um, understood the need to create uh, funding dollars that were more operational instead of programming. And that's what we need because we don't know what's going on um, with this COVID-19 pandemic and the need changes all the time. So um, that if I can give that information to our, our, our fellow uh, organization runners and directors and presidents, uh, please also continue having conversations with your funders. Um, as far as our medical um, access, so, uh, as I mentioned before, it was already hard enough to, um, you know, get these resources, these medical resources within the community, um, especially within safe uh, medical practices that were, like, actually safe for our community. I mean, up here, we have doctors that will troll you on Facebook um, if you have to make a complaint about their medical malpractice. And for a doctor of any caliber to have access to their patients' um, Facebook pages and actually engaging with them is dangerous and it's violent. And um, that's something that we have to deal with, uh, with a particular doctor here in Pittsburgh, um, as well as uh, doctors around uh, the state. Um, this is not the only case of that. So it breaks that uh, confidentiality, that, that trust for uh, the tr to want to have a doctor um, within our region. And then when we do find uh, medical facilities that are, you know, affirming to us and who we are, um, these are sometimes cases where we are, I, I use the terminology guinea pigs, where they do not understand how to uh, 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 assess us because they are still learning. They're still going through their first year trial or their second year uh, trial to see what this looks like. And uh, what I would offer to these spaces, is, these medical spaces, is to get training from trans people, right? Um, have trans people during your trainings in your spaces. So you are hearing our experiences from our mouth so that we are able to uh, tell you what we're experiencing, uh, what's good, what's bad, what works, what doesn't work. Um, that is a huge, huge thing. Uh, within our data collection, we noticed that uh, trans people, specifically in Allegheny County, were having trouble accessing HRT because of the factor I just mentioned, and also because of the factor of accessing it, getting to the medical, uh, the medical uh, uh, space to get HRT. Um, and feeling safe doing so um, during, the pan during a pandemic. So there were so many different factors um, in this, and which also factored in with Black trans people being able to access um, these hormones, um, even needles, even syringes, you know, um, down to uh, alcohol wipes. Um, these were things that were being hard to access. So um, that's what our data showed. I'm sure as we continue to collect this data and uh, share this data with other organizations and uh, spaces, it'll show the same thing. But um, yeah, that's where we where we uh, where we were with that. Thank you. Thank you, Fiora, for that. Um, 
that's a big big deal uh, here in the South with medical access. People just do not have readily access to medical care that's adequate and competent enough to be able to provide to us. Um, and a lot of times we end up um, teaching our doctors how to care for us, which is not, it shouldn't be the case. That should not be the case. Um, I want to switch us over uh, a little bit and talk about the current state of violence. Um, that Black people, more specifically trans folks, are experiencing um, at the hands of the state. Um, the state is not doing anything um, to protect us, as in policies and things of that nature. Um, as Sahar pointed out so eloquently, um, the people who we have entrusted to lead this country, um, they they have positioned themselves to erase us and to not be not to not protect us. Um, how has that affected your leadership? Uh, because we're Black trans leaders here, um, and we're not exempt from any form of violence, whether that's coming on our Facebook and harassing and trolling us, or us actually, you know, experiencing physical violence. How has that affected your leadership? How has the increased violence affected your community? Um, yeah. We can start with Zahara. State sanctioned violence is something that we've been having to deal with in Georgia for a very long time, especially when it comes to Black trans women. Um, the state has shown us that we are insignificant to them. Um, our Blackness doesn't matter to them. Our Blackness have been our Blackness have had balance against it for centuries here in America, especially here in Georgia, and the state has continued to sanction that violence, and we still see that today. Um, also, and we think about how it affects Black trans women, especially Black trans women here in the South. We see violence being sanctioned by the state because these cases haven't been solved, and they continue to not be solved year after year, turning into a cold case and nothing has been done about it. That's why we have to continue to fight against these systems that seeks to oppress us, that seeks to hold us down, and we have to continue on our path towards liberation. Thank you, Sihara. Carson? Yeah, so um, when we talk about violence, um, you know, you mentioned you know, Aubrey, you know, I know it's cisgender, but for me, it really hit home. Um, I was floored. I was very upset about it. But the reality is, right, as Black leaders, it's real, right? I mean, some oppression, uh, racism is very live and well in 2020. Um, it is time for people to stop acting oblivious to things as well, like we don't know what's going on. I mean, the reality is we do know what it's like to step outside and have to feel like, am I being watched? Am I going to be questioned, like go certain places? And it sucks to have to live your life like that, right? Um, your question asked about how does it affect our leadership? I would say, like, as far as our organization goes, we're, we're huge on that. Um, I feel like we know what's going on, especially with our Black trans women. You know, Jacksonville has had back-to-back -back murders since... God knows what 2019, even longer than that. And a lot of times we see these stories, you know, we, we see it on the news and it's just after that, you know, there's no justice. We don't know who died. And I think 2019, I would say is my first time from my experience, like I guess say, okay, they had arrested a little bit more people as far as our black trans folks go, but nine times out of 10, we don't even know who did it and nobody wants to speak up. And I don't feel like as Black trans leaders, we should be silenced about this either. I think at this point, we really need to rally together. And if it comes down to protesting and doing the things that some of these civil rights leaders used to do, we need to start doing that. I mean, it's, it's outrageous that anybody should have to live with a target on their back. It's unacceptable. But that's why I said, I guess for me, it's not even just being a Black trans man. It's like, I'm Black first, I'm trans second. So I, I didn't know what the experience is on both, you know, spectrums. Um, but the last thing I want to say, this is why I'm also a part of networking with the right people. Um, I could say that, you know, even with police, that trust is broken with, with black people and trans people. Like, let's just be honest. 
um, you know, we don't, people just don't feel comfortable, right? I mean, people have had experiences where they've called the cops and they don't feel like they're going to do anything about it or they're going to get judged and discriminated because she is trans. The trans woman may be trans, right? So I feel like it's so important for us to find those candidates, those people that are, are in the police systems, uh, uh, the uh, justice systems that we can, you know, work with, with, which is why I am with the Dolphin Democrats here in Fort Lauderdale was because I feel like politics is so important. If we don't have an ally somewhere in these rooms, we're in trouble. But even myself have been left down with wanting to know a murder that happened on 79th Street in Miami last year. You know, someone that was an ex-police chief or something told me that, you know, she would get back to me to find out what happened and never, never found out what happened. So, um, but that's just me. I guess I could, obviously it affects our work, right? Because I get very passionate when it comes down to violence. It's just, it's sad. I think we're all tired of mourning. We're all tired of visuals. We're, we're tired of it all. We just want justice and to be treated fairly and with respect. So that's it. Thank you for that, Carson. And I really appreciate you stepping up in your leadership to advocate for Black trans women who've been murdered in uh, Florida. Um, and I want to um, push you to speak more to um, your own experience, because like you, you mentioned, you're Black, you're trans, and you're a Black man. Um, and you mentioned uh, uh, Ahmad. Being Black, being trans, and being a man, like, what is your daily experience? Like, when you start your day, you go out, because I've talked to a lot of different uh, trans masculine folks, and and, and they have a, a very, very valid um, plight when it comes to this because people uh, erase your experience as a Black man and only see your transness and don't necessarily connect that to the violence against Black men uh, at the hands of the state. How does that affect you personally? I'm so glad you asked that. Actually, you know what? It's kind of nice to be on a panel and not be the host because now I can kind of be a little bit more transparent. Um, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, I work in the IT field. I say I work in, as a computer engineer by day. I'm an advocate by night. And I work in Brickell. I'm going to keep it 100 with you. Um, you know, majority of my office is white and Hispanic people. Um and when I go in there, you know, when they hear my name, Carson, obviously it has a, a, a different meaning. So when, before they would see me in the room, it's like, you're Carson, you know? And I, I know my name gets me in certain doors, but the reality is I, I can tell when people look at me a certain way and it's like, does he really know what he's doing? And then when I, it's like, I have to work twice as hard and it sucks, right? It's just like, I've gone into stores or I've gotten pulled over one time you know, I think I was going a little bit over the speed limit and I was asked, you know, is this your, is this your car? Like, are you driving a rental car? And it's just like, it, it's, it's horrible. I, th I think that's why I said, you know, being a black man in America and trans, it's just a double whammy almost, you know, it's, it's just, you have to constantly be aware of the situations of where you are and being very careful because that's just how this world is set up right now. But it shouldn't be that way, right? I should be able to be respected just like any other male would anywhere, either a workplace or a store. You know, I'm not here to steal nothing. I'm not, you know, I work very hard. But like I said, let's just be real. Either, whether you're a black woman, black trans woman, black trans man, we work twice as hard than anybody out here. And it's not fair. So <laughs> I'm just keeping it real with you guys. And we appreciate your realness and your authenticity. Uh, Fior, you want to take on that question and kind of speak to um, your feelings around that? All right. Um, yeah. Um, thank you, Carson, so much for that testimony. Um, that's definitely a conversation uh, that needs to be had more. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so affecting our leadership, um, and just piggybacking off of what Carson uh, was saying, uh, we, found our, we find ourselves in um, positions of having to work double, triple harder than communities around us, or our cis counterparts, and which are normally looking at us, especially when we're Black, like, 
Are they smart enough to do this? Are they equipped enough to do this work? Can they run a 501c3 organization? Can they lead in these different positions um, and their voice be valid, right? So that has always been um, a huge concern that um, has affected my leadership um, and affected uh, leadership to those around me. Um, because we also have to uh, remember what the dominance of uh, this leadership is looking like currently in our states um, around the country is, is cisgender leadership. And what we need to do is begin to also shift that narrative. We need to be running for office. Um, we need to be um, investing in Black trans people running for office and making sure while they're doing so, protecting them um, in those positions. Um, in Pittsburgh or Pennsylvania specifically, we have um, our uh, uh, Dr. Rachel Levine. Uh, she's been leading us through uh, this pandemic at a state level with our governor. Um, and she's an out trans woman who has been doing amazing work, um, you know, in Pennsylvania to provide the resources um, and understanding of what we need to be prepared for during this pandemic. And even during the pandemic, I mean, people um, found time to actually make fun of her for being trans. And it, it was just ridiculous of the, the minds of cisgender people um, during a pandemic. Like, you, not all, of course, but uh, those that would find time to actually focus on someone's gender identity instead of, like, staying safe um, and keeping those safe around us. So um, we have to be looking at that. We also be have, have to be looking at policies within our individual states, um, within our, our counties, our cities. We have to be paying attention to this, these policies, um, specifically the panic and defense um, uh, policy that allows people who murder uh, trans people uh, to get away with it. So we have to be paying attention to policies like this. We have to be paying attention to elected officials who want to push these uh, 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 off the House floor, right? We have to be backing these candidates as well um, when they are pushing these. And um, there are candidates in Pennsylvania um, that are pushing these uh uh, pushing the panic defense to be a thing of, that doesn't exist. So we have to be paying attention to these candidates that are actually investing in trans people um, in our individual states. Um, and that brings me back to the importance of counting our communities. Um, it's so important to count our trans communities. If we were counting um, uh, the actual, like the deaths that are happening on a uh, state level, on a federal level. If those, if they were being counted, um, we would be able, or the state in uh, these, uh, in the federal, on the federal level, would be able to prevent these before they happen. So that's another uh, huge, huge thing we need to be paying attention to, is making sure we are counted. And we do not have to settle for the federal government uh, census ideology. We know we exist. We have bodies, we have organizations, we have allies. We can create uh, uh, these surveys. We can create these surveys on state levels, talking to your, gover uh, your governors, lobbying with your candidates um, in your counties, uh, uh, letting them know that we are here, we deserve to be counted, we need resources, and being unapologetic about that. Um, we cannot allow the federal uh, on the federal level for us to continue to be erased when we have allies within our individual states that can make sure that we are counted. Um, so, uh, and that's something our Pennsylvania coalition is also going to be working on um, with other partners and affiliates uh, within our state. Um, and I think that's where I want to end. No, I don't want to end there. I do want to bring up, and I want to talk about the violence, that, the violence piece as well. Um, just last month, um, we lost a Black trans woman in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, Michelle Tamika Washington. And um, murders like that are murders of many of Black trans women. And when I, as a Black trans woman, are watching the news or, or reading these articles, it's, it's so hard not to see my face as a possibility to be on this news article, even during my work, right? Um, it, it just, it, it does something to me. But what I also believe in is um, 
our ancestors, our transcestors um, around this country and the energy that that brings to our community uh, when we are facing this violence and when we need the strength to continue to move forward for us to call on our ancestors to guide us through this. And that's been my therapy and my mantra um, through this before the pandemic, especially during this pandemic and continuing after this pandemic and teaching our trans communities how to heal, um, how to um, understand what love feel, feels like. Because a lot of us, especially Black trans folks, we don't know what love feels like because we grew up in households that did not love us. So actually being able to uh, find that healing space that heals us internally before we move on to uh, leadership initiatives and coming together is so vital. And um, keeping that in mind and my leadership has really pushed me forward um, and inspired me to keep going and feeding my community however I can. Thank you, Ciara. Um, both of you all, I think all three of you all mentioned um, the violence and the prosecution of this violence. Um, and I like to think of like transformative justice um, instead of like punitive or prisons and jails. Uh, yeah. So any thoughts or opinions around transformative justice and how that could be a thing um, in response to the violence against Black folks, against trans people? We could start with Kahara. We are abolitionists with transcendent barriers. Our work is through the lens of abolishing the prison industrial complex. So we always think of how justice for us looks. And that is through transformative justice, removing the current justice system that is in place, that is based upon locking people up and putting them behind cages. The, the, the type of punishment that exists with this is we respond to the punishment through harm and violence. We have always practiced and, and been able done our work through the lens of abolition and as an abolitionist. And we think of ways, the, the first thing is to end the state sanctioned violence that exists within our state to allow, to continue to allow people to walk the streets who, who continue to inflict violence upon us. These cases are not being solved. They're not finding the individuals who are responsible for taking the life of these beautiful Black trans women, beautiful trans women of color that are being murdered year after year after year, and nothing is being done about it. It sends a strong message to the public that Black trans bodies are not important to the state. They will not protect Black trans bodies, and that they can continue to harm us with impunity. That is something that we have to continue to fight against. We have to continue to uh, let pe let these systems know, let these p people that are in positions of power uh, know that we will continue to fight for justice for our trans families. Carson, you want to take a stab at that? Kayla, do me a favor. Can you repeat the um, question one more time for me? Yeah, I can. So, um, transformative justice. Um, thinking through that lens, uh, what are some? What are your thoughts around that? Um, is there any advocacy in your local area that you're either a part of, or, you, or that you know of, around transformative justice measures in response to the violence against Black bodies? Um, totally inclusive of trans people? Um, when it pertains to South Florida, um, I would say not necessarily that we have anything like that right now. Um, I know with TIG, we, we have had the opportunity to, to talk to the sheriff's department and they do want to implement some type of safety measures for trans folks. And I guess what, I don't know when they're going to launch this now because of COVID, but um, it definitely needs to happen soon. Uh, basically the way it would work is I guess more of the trans community would be on this advisory board. And basically they're thinking of having some type of 
maybe some police officers that can be in certain areas, um, but also provide the, you know, the police department's training on how to work better with trans folks. Um, we did just have a rally recently for a trans woman that, you know, she used to work at a barber shop. And long story short, her and the manager got into a fight, became physical, um, and it didn't end so well. Um, you know, obviously she's still with us, but she lost her job. So, you know, the police really didn't get too much involved, but I know that we made sure that, uh, you know, she found an attorney or a lawyer that could help. But I think as far as it's going forward, I would say this is the biggest thing. I feel like we both need to listen on both sides. I feel like we need to stop labeling black trans women as angry black trans women or angry black people in general. Um, but also learning from both sides. I feel like the, the justice system needs to hear from black trans people in particularly, you know, even immigrants that are having issues. And, but we also need to listen to them. And I feel like we need to tackle both ways of being innovative, but also using some old school justice, informative ways to get things done. But we also need to stay persistent. Um, because like I said, again, I think the biggest thing as leaders, I think that's where the leaders have to come in, where, you know, a lot of times our community, we, we get very impatient because it doesn't move, you know, fast enough. Uh, so it's all about staying consistent and working together as leaders and also just, you know, banding together just so that we can make things happen. But uh, that's that's all I can say as far as the transformative uh, movement. Thank you. Are. Yeah, I think um, what we're what we're doing now, right now, is a form of trans transformative justice. Um, coming together to have these conversations um, is definitely, especially nationally, right, um, around the country, is, is is so vital, so vital, and a part of that transformative um, justice as well. I would also uh, like to highlight um, just the work some of the work we've been doing here in Pittsburgh around our jail. So um, in Allegheny County Jail, we have been supporting our trans inmates um, as we can, of course, um, through various lanes, through um, our advisory council of Pittsburgh, through the Allegheny County um, Jail Oversight Board. Um, we currently have an ally who is chairing that board, thank God, um, the old uh, judge that was chairing Allegheny County Jail uh, Board um, was a horrible person, and we showed up at those meetings every single time um, to make sure that he was accountable, and he ended up leaving the board, which worked out for us um, because we were able to, again, get an ally um, in there and have intentional one-on-one -on -one conversations with our allies. Um, currently uh, in Pittsburgh, we are still dealing um, not only with a warden that needs fired, um, for a whole a whole lot of different reasons, not just um, you know how trans folk are treated within the jail, how black people in general are treated within the jail, how humans right are treated within the jail. Um, but we also need to be paying attention to our county execs. We need to be paying attention to the uh, the, the, the the guy usually the guys in charge, the white cis men in charge. We need to be paying attention to them um, and holding them accountable as well unapologetically all the time, um, that's transformative justice, is sitting in spaces that we aren't supposed to be in, right, uh, where they don't expect us to show up at. They don't expect us to show up at jail oversight boards. They don't expect us to show up at um, their budget meetings, their uh, 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 county meetings. They don't expect us to show up at those things. So we need to continue um, around the country uh, showing up in these spaces and making sure that we are a voice within these spaces and holding these, uh, these folks accountable. And that's along with our allies. Our allies, and, and, and I, tra I transition out of the word ally. We need comrades. We don't need allies, we need comrades. We need people that are willing to put their bodies um, in a position to make sure that we are counted, protected, valued, lifted up in spaces that we are not in. We need comrades that are doing that unapologetically. Um, the whole ally phase, we gotta let that go um, because the ally phase has gotten us uh, killed more and more and more and more and more. 
So we do, the ally, is that's not working. We need to transition to having comrades that are willing to lose their job for us, willing to uh, uh, step up to their boss for us to protect us. Uh, we need allies like that or comrades like that. And until we have that, we will not have the liberty. Um, we will not have the reparations that we deserve because yes, black trans people are owed reparations as well. And that is along within that transformative justice piece. We deserve reparations on many planes um, within this country. So um, looking at those things and again, paying attention to who is elected uh, in these positions, in our counties, in our states, in our boroughs, um, wherever you are paying attention to these people. And if they are not mentioning trans people, if they're not mentioning black trans people, we need to really think about where we're voting. Thank you, that was powerful. I just wanna add something to that. We also need our comrades to not only get fired from their job uh, for the sake of trans folks and our, and our safety and our comfort, but we also need them to not take jobs. We also need them to step aside um, in these particular roles that they know are fitting for trans folks. Uh, and we see that a lot where people who do not necessarily um, have a genuine connection to a certain community, but they're actually serving that community. And, and, and that's not what allyship looks like. Allyship looks like stepping aside to make space for people um, who are directly affected and impacted. Uh, I'm gonna move us to our last question. Um, and it's, uh, it's something that came up, uh, Zahara, you mentioned it. Um, and it was about state-sanctioned violence. And I want us to break that down um, pretty quickly um, to go and hold people too long. Um, but I want us to break that down so that people who are viewing this live understand what we mean when we say state-sanctioned violence. Because, you know, language is, is a very tricky thing. Um, and we want to make it plain for people to understand exactly what we mean. I'm going to go to you, Sahara, um, for that. Um, understanding that the state has failed its duty and putting us and they have. So how are you breaking up a little bit? I'm sorry. Okay, you sound a little better now. You want to go ahead? Yeah, I can go ahead. Um, yeah, but so as I was saying, the violence is sanctioned by the state through ways of the indirectly failing to protect us, failing to utilize their power and their duty towards protecting us. They have failed to do so, and it sends a message to individuals who seek to harm us. There are people who have, who see that we should that our life shouldn't that our life doesn't matter that we shouldn't be here that we shouldn't be living and breathing, and through that message, it fuels individuals to continue to inflict violence on our bodies. And the state continues to fail to do anything about it. The, the state fails to even acknowledge that we are being targeted because they fail to acknowledge us as a people. Thank you for that. Uh, Fiora, would you like to uh, answer that? You're on there we go. Um, I was saying uh, thank you, Zahara, for uh, bringing up those great points. Um, I think it's perfectly okay to admit and to hold our allies and comrades accountable to the fact that they did fail us. They have been failing us. Um, for decades, they failed us, even while um, black trans people were liberating our people just existing as a people. We are black. So when we are per looked at, we are perceived as black first and transgender next. Um, and, and not even in all cases. In a lot of cases, it's just always they're black. Um, but we have to understand that being black is not a monolith as, as, we, as we know. Um, it is okay for us to tell our comrades you have failed me, but this is how you can do better. 
if that comrade is able to sit in that space and learn from that, no matter how we need to address how we are feeling to said comrade, they should be in a position to listen and to learn what we need, while also bringing us to the table. It is so vital that um, our comrades, and I'm speaking specifically towards our cisgender uh, comrades, um, they need to bring us to the table. We do not need you to speak for us. We are not a community that is uh, not capable of leading and making smart decisions. We are, in fact, capable of making smarter decisions um, than a lot of our cis counterparts, especially when it has to come to our transgender and non-binary communities. So when you are creating spaces around the country, within your state, and you are not including trans people, trans voices, and trans bodies in those spaces and conversations, you are doing no justice to your constituents, no justice to your voters. Uh, you are doing uh, no justice to you. So I think we need to really tap into um, looking at our comrades that are bringing us to the table. And, and I'm not just mentioning um, a local community uh, 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 panel or discussion, which is still wonderful, but we need to be brought to uh, county level conversations. We need to be brought to state level conversations. Um, right now, Pennsylvania, we're the only state in the country that has an LGBTQ plus uh, commission. This commission needs to be modeled by other uh, uh, governor's offices around the country. Um, we need to have representation at a state level um, around the country. And that's going to mean uh, those governor uh, office liaisons reaching out to Pennsylvania to see how uh, Pennsylvania has started this commission, how to get people on this commission, and to always look deep within the margins of who are you going to have on these commissions. And in my opinion, in my opinion, I think a commission um, around uh, this country should have a predominance of black and brown, trans and non-binary people. And when you bring us to the table, we can counteract the murders and violence. We can communicate directly with our governors and liaisons um, and executive directors uh, to make sure that the information that we are bringing from the grassroots level is coming up to the state level and that the state is actually being accountable for the violence that is happening within our, our individual states. And when that happens, we're going to be able to address not only the violence, the murders, but then we can also move into economic development, um, economics for our transgender community and what that looks like. And I just uh, mentioned that earlier of what that economic development will look like for our communities. And that's true, again, creating coalitions, creating commissions, uh, creating spaces that are centered around the experiences and voices of those most affected. Um, and right now, as we know, those most affected are black and brown trans people, more specifically black trans women um, in this country. So uh, looking at those and tying those together is where I'm at with it. Thank you. That's powerful and I really appreciate you saying those words. Your, Carson, you want to uh, give some lasting, um, well, some last thoughts around safe section violence and, and how that looks for you? Um, I'll keep it short. I think Sierra really said a mouthful. I really don't think I have much to say. Um, I think one of the biggest points that Sierra said is, I wrote it down here, was showing up to meetings that they don't expect, expect us to be at is key. Like, I don't, I don't think I could say that anymore. I think that's going to be my motto throughout the rest of the year. Um, you know, as trans folks, a lot of times we don't like being in uncomfortable spaces. Um, sometimes we haven't even unpacked our own traumas that we have going through, so we don't know how to be in those spaces. But those spaces are very important to be at. And, and, and that's how you're going to shake and move and disrupt and, and create the environment that we seek to have, which overall is just to be respected and treated fairly, right? So um, that's all I have to say. I really felt like Sierra really 
really said everything as far as what needed to be said. So. Thank you. Um, yeah, Ben, you're you're right. Uh, those sentiments are mine exactly. Um, this has been a powerful call, a very powerful conversation, much needed. And um, to reemphasize what CR said, this is a conversation that needs to be happening uh, more often. Um, and I'm looking forward to making sure that 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 does happen. Um, and I want to say I appreciate you all taking time uh, out of your busy schedules because I know you're very busy people uh, to sit down with us and discuss these things in detail. Um, and I'm looking forward to following up with these conversations uh, in our coalition. Um, and on behalf of the Transgender Law Center, thank you so much for your time. Um, and we have reached our time uh, today. And I want to thank everybody who has viewed this live uh, and who shared this live. Um, I just want to say thank you. <laughs>